Good afternoon. Welcome to King of Kings on this Ash Wednesday. We begin this season of Lent, this season of repentance, and as we do, we're going to follow this year Jesus' final steps toward the cross. And tonight, specifically, we look at Jesus' visit to Lazarus' tomb. We'll begin with our first hymn, hymn number 655. Please stand. Brothers and sisters, God created us to know joy and communion with him, to love all humanity and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors and creation. And so we do not enjoy the life our creator intended for us. Also, by our sin, we grieve our Father, who does not desire us to come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. Therefore, God, in his mercy, has sent Jesus Christ to take our place under the law, to suffer for us, and to die the death we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. During the 40 days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us that in order to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. 
As the disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from the love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to commit yourselves to this struggle and to confess your sins, asking our Father for strength. Return to me with all your heart, says the Lord, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, with broken and contrite hearts. Return to the Lord your God. Let us be silent. Let us be still. And pause now for the time of reflection and self-examination. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. Remember that you are dust and to dust you will return. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation. By the cross and suffering of your Son, O Lord, God has spoken. Clearly, He declares, Be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. As far as the East is from the West, so far have your sins been removed. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses you from all your sins. Though they be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Go in peace and joy. You are free to be a blessing to others all the days of your life. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we have peace. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <laughs> Almighty and merciful God, you never despise what you have made and always forgive those who turn to you. Create in us such new and contrite hearts that we may truly repent of our sins and obtain your full and gracious pardon through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson for Ash Wednesday is recorded in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 1 through 20. Yes, our rebellious deeds are many before you, and our sins testify against us. Our rebellious deeds are with us, and as for our guilty deeds, we are aware of them. Those deeds are rebellion and treachery against the Lord. We turn back from following our God, we incite oppression and apostasy. We conceive and mutter deceitful words from our hearts. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth stumbles in the city square and honesty cannot enter. The truth is missing and anyone who turns from evil makes himself prey. The Lord looked and saw something <laughs> evil. There was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one who could intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him, and his own righteousness supported him. He clothed himself with righteousness like armor and wore a helmet of salvation on his head. He dressed in garments of for vengeance, and he wrapped himself with zeal like a cloak. He will repay in full what they have earned, namely wrath to his foes and full payment to his enemies. He will repay even the distant coastlands from the west they will fear the Lord's name, and from the rising of the sun they will fear his glory, for he will come like a raging river driven by the Spirit of the Lord. <coughs> then a Redeemer will come for Zion, and for those in Jacob who turn from rebellion. 
This is the declaration of the Lord. Our psalm for this afternoon is Psalm 51 on pages 5 and 6 of your worship form. The second lesson is recorded in Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. For even if I caused you sorrow with my letter, I do not regret it, even though I did regret it. For I see that my letter caused you sorrow, yet only for a little while. Now I rejoice, not because you were made to feel sorrow, but because this sorrow resulted in repentance. Yes, you were made sorry in a godly way. So you were not harmed in any way by us. In fact, godly sorrow produces repentance, which leads to salvation, leaving no regret. On the other hand, worldly sorrow produces death. Yes, look what godly sorrow produced in you. What diligence, what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what zeal, what correction. In every way you proved yourselves to be pure in this matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not because of the one who did what was wrong or because of the one who was harmed by it. I wrote instead so that your genuine concern for us would be revealed to you in the sight of God. For that reason, we have been comforted. In addition to our comfort, we rejoice a great deal more at the joy of Titus because all of you have set his spirit at rest. The word of the Lord. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Please stand for the gospel. The gospel lesson is recorded in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. Be careful that you do not do your righteous works in front of people, so that they will notice. If you do, you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. 
So whenever you pour, perform acts of mercy, do not sound a trumpet for yourself, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be praised by people. Amen, I tell you. They have received their reward. Instead, when you perform acts of mercy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Then your acts of mercy will be in secret, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by people. Amen, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your private room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what others cannot see will reward you. Whenever you fast, do not make yourself look sad like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces to show everyone that they're fasting. Amen, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that it is not apparent to people that you are fasting, but only to your Father who sees what is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. <coughs> Do not store up treasures for yourselves on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up treasures for yourselves in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day. It's hymn number 650, From Depths of, War, of Woe, Lord God, I Cry. <laughs>
Grace and mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our devotion this afternoon comes from the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Now a certain man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus was sick, was the same Mary who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent a message to Jesus saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness is not going to result in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed in the place where he was two more days. Then afterwards, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, recently the Jews were trying to stone you, and you're going to go back there again? He said this and then told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Then the disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will get well. Jesus had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was merely talking about ordinary sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sake that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But, I, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. After she said this, Martha went back to call her sister Mary. She whispered, the teacher is here and is calling for you. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. He asked, where have you laid him? They told him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Jesus was deeply moved again as he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Take away the stone, he said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor because it has been four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out with his feet and his hands bound with strips of linen and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus told them, loose him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. They asked, what are we going to do? Because this man is doing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not even consider that, is, 
better for us that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not just say this on his own, but as the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not only for that nation, but also in order to gather into one the scattered children of God. So from that day on, they plotted to kill him. So far, God's word. We find ourselves in a very familiar place today. In fact, the subject that we're going to talk about is one that I have probably talked about in my ministry more than any other. The Apostle Paul wrote about it as he wrote to the Christians in and around Rome. And he was having a very difficult conversation with them, reminding them that it's not only individuals that suffer. But in fact, all of creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth, waiting for us to be born into a new life, into a perfect life, uh, the kind of life that God wanted for us from the beginning, the kind of world that he created, a life in which the presence of God can no longer be obscured by sin. The whole earth is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. But it's not just the earth. It's you too. Everyone who lives in the sin-broken world is groaning, and they will be groaning because of the effects of sin all the way until God destroys this world or takes them home to heaven and death. We've seen it. We saw it this week. A winter resident who has come here for years and years and years didn't come this year because she was sick, she was failing, and it took a long time, a slow decline, but that doesn't diminish the hole in the hearts of her family members because this week she was called home to heaven happened to one of our year-round members, too. His son had been sick for a long time with cancer, but for the moment, it appeared that he was stable. And then, just like that, unexpectedly, God took him home to heaven. And when things like that happen, it leaves us asking the question, why, Lord, why would you allow this to happen to your people why, Lord, would you have this happen to us in our lives right now? And maybe the groaning that you've experienced isn't about death. Maybe it's about isolation and loneliness. Or maybe it's about prolonged illness that you've been dealing with your life. Or just the simple fact that you can't afford the things that everyone else takes for granted in life. Maybe those are the source of your groaning, but all of us have been there before. And we need what the Apostle Paul reminded the Romans when he said, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. That's basically the same truth Jesus teaches us today in the gospel lesson as well. It's funny, as human beings, we never really know when our life is going to be ripped apart by sin, when sin is going to come into our life and just tear us up. But that's what makes Jesus so amazing because he knew. He knew everything that would happen to him as he made his way to an inevitable death on the cross and he took his final steps anyway. He did that because he loved you so much. With a self-sacrificing love, Jesus took those final steps that he knew would bring him to the cross. That's what we're looking at this year in our Lenten series, Jesus' final steps to the cross. And this afternoon, specifically, we're going to look at Jesus coming to a tomb, to a grave, and we're going to see that this incident pushed Jesus' enemies to turn against him in a way that they had not before with vigor, 
with zeal in order to get rid of him. And it's a miracle, no doubt. Maybe the most powerful, dramatical, dramatic miracle of all of Jesus' life, other than his own resurrection from the dead. And we're going to see that he, God did that miracle for two reasons. Jesus takes the final steps to this tomb in order that our faith might be strengthened, first of all, and also so that his plan of salvation might be completed. Bethany was only two miles away from Jerusalem. How long would it take you to walk two miles? The fact that the last time that Jesus had been in that region, in that vicinity, the enemies of the Savior tried to stone him. That's not the reason why he didn't go. That's not the reason he didn't rush to Lazarus' grave the moment that he heard that his dear friend was sick. And the disciples had to be confused, don't you think? Because they had been with Jesus when he interrupted everything, dropped everything to help out a complete stranger. And now, when Lazarus, his friend, was sick, he waited. He waited. Not minutes. Not hours. Days. The disciples had to have been confused, but don't you think Mary and Martha were confused too? You hear it in Martha's words when she comes to meet Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's not that Jesus didn't care. John says it in the text. John tells us he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. I don't know about you, but that sounds so clinical to me, <laughs> the way John says it. Literally, Jesus was torn up in his guts. His spirit was groaning over what had happened. It wasn't that he didn't care. He didn't take those steps to Lazarus' grave right away because he had a bigger purpose in mind. Did you hear what he told the disciples? The sickness is not going to result in death. He told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. He assured Martha, I, your brother will rise again, and I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. John only records this one little brief sentence that Martha spoke to Mary. The teacher here is calling for you. But even though those are the only words that are recorded, I wonder if maybe Martha shared the rest of what Jesus said with her as well. And yet, she comes to Jesus. She says the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They had seen Jesus' love. They knew his compassion. They witnessed his power. But that's the way it is, isn't it? We who have experienced the power of Jesus, the, the love our Savior has for us, sometimes we don't just need to hear it. We need to see it. Jesus gave the order, take away the stone. And Martha's objection is totally understandable. The Jews, they didn't embalm their dead bodies, so the smell of death would have poured out from that grave the moment the stone was taken away. But it was the Lord of life giving that command, and he was giving this guarantee. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out with his feet and his hands bound with strips of linen and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus told them, loose him and let him 
go. Can you imagine? That kind of raw power, that drama, drama only built up by the day's delay that Jesus took before he took his final steps toward Lazarus' tomb. But he did that for a very important reason, because two grieving sisters needed their brother back from the dead in order that their faith might be strengthened. Lazarus needed that. He needed to be able to recall that amazing account of how he had been in the grave, cold as death, and the Lord called him back to life to know that Jesus was in control of absolutely every aspect of his life and powerful enough to do anything. Lazarus needed that, and the disciples needed it too. Because Jesus would call them to do his work after he ascended into heaven, he made them bold, eyewitnesses of his glory, so that they could be his faithful servants. They needed it. We need it. We need it every single time we stand at the casket of someone we love, because then we get to hear these words that Jesus spoke in our text. I am the resurrection and the life. Thank you, Jesus, for delaying your steps to the grave of Lazarus. We needed that. We needed that account of Jesus waiting until there was, humanly speaking, absolutely no hope whatsoever so that we could know that when he says, because I live, you also will live, we can believe it. Because he already demonstrated power over death. Here is proof that nothing is impossible with God. Here is proof that Jesus is in control of every aspect of life and death. Here is the reason why we listen to the Apostle Paul and say together with him in total conviction, death has been swallowed up in victory. Do you see it? Why Jesus delayed in taking his final steps to the tomb of Lazarus, he did that so that our faith might be strengthened and grow and be rock solid for life. And what is true about death is just as true about loneliness, just as true about financial trouble, just as true of prolonged illness and every struggle we face in life, Jesus does what we need at precisely the moment we need it. So when we pray, and it seems like he's unaware of all of those things that are invading in our lives and keeping us from happiness and joy, because of this account, we can know that Jesus does exactly what we need at precisely the moment we need it so that our faith might be strengthened. So this miracle strengthened the faith of his first followers. It strengthens our faith too, but miracles can't save. And miracles can't even create faith. Some who saw it believed, but other people, when they saw it, they went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the priests and Pharisees called the meeting of the Sanhedrin. They asked, what are you going to do? Because this man is doing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said, you know nothing at all. You do not even consider that it is better for us that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not only for that nation, but also in order to gather into the one, the scattered children of God. So from that day on, they plotted to kill him. They'd always been waiting, 
always been watching, always been hoping that Jesus would say that one thing or do that one thing that would trip him up and discredit him and allow them to get rid of him. They were always watching and waiting and hoping, but that time never came because Jesus was the perfect sinless Son of God. And Jesus kept on walking that path of righteousness, the path that could only end in his death. But this moment at the grave of his friend Lazarus was vital and essential into bringing God's plan of salvation to completion. The news about what Jesus did went viral. And many people who saw it believed, but his enemies were hardened in their hatred for Jesus. They were dead set on not just opposing him, but on putting him to death. Jesus' final steps led him to a tomb that needed to be emptied. Emptied so that the hatred of Jesus' enemies would be filled in their hearts so that they could take that hatred and that scorn for Jesus in the middle of the night and come to him and arrest him and put him on trial illegally in the middle of the night so that they convict him of a crime that he didn't commit so they could put him to death, an execution on the cross reserved for the worst of all criminals, all coming from their hatred, built from this incident at Lazarus' tomb. You see what God does? He used their hatred. He used their hatred as a tool, as a tool to put his plan of salvation into completion. Do you see how vital, how crucial those final steps of Jesus were? Steps that cemented the faith of his first followers in a way that only God could. Steps that remind us that in fact God is in control of absolutely everything and when we pray and we don't get the answer that we want, we have this confidence that God is doing exactly what we need at that moment, steps that took Jesus to Lazarus' tomb that remind us God's incredible insight. They built up the faith of followers. They spurred on the completion of God's plan of salvation. They took them to the cross. What happened at that cross? Every bit of your sin placed on Jesus his holy, perfect, divine blood washing you clean, cleansing you of all of your offenses, all of your guilt for every single one of your sins, big sins or small sins, was carried on the shoulders of Jesus. Jesus experienced the isolation from his father as his own father turned his back on him. Jesus descends to the depths of hell to endure punishment so that you didn't have to. Recall that miracle. Recall that miracle every time you're struggling with the answer to the question, why God and why now? And then rejoice that Jesus kept on walking all the way into the teeth of his enemies so that he could accomplish your salvation and take you to a life where none of those things will ever be able to touch you ever, ever again. As long as you live here, the world is going to groan. All creation groans. And as long as you live in this world, you're going to groan too. But we know that one day that groaning is going to come to an end. And then we can say together with the Apostle Paul, I conclude that our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Until that day, Lord, strengthen us. Strengthen us, Lord, with whatever you think we need. Take us back to the tomb of Lazarus and see a Lord who has power over life and death, your life, and your death too. Amen.
peace of God that transcends all human understanding. Guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We'll bring our offering to the Lord. stand for prayer. O God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and also our dear Father, we thank you for permitting us to begin another Lenten season. You have graciously granted another opportunity for our relationship to be strengthened with him who died to save us from our sins. In spirit, we appear before you in sackcloth and ashes. Help us to withstand the temptations of permitting the pleasures and worries of this life and the activities of our daily routine to interfere with our Lenten worship and observance. Help us to be conquerors over every temptation that confronts us. Add your blessing to the Lenten messages and through them strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. We include in our prayers today the family of Bruce, Bruce Schreiner. His uh, son, Andrew, was unexpectedly called home to heaven this week. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we ask that you would comfort Andrew's family, whom you now have called to eternal glory in heaven. We praise you for making him your child in baptism and sustaining his faith through the good news about Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for the blessings you brought to your church, this community, his community, and his family through his life of Christian service. May the peace and promise of your son's atoning sacrifice on the cross and his empty tomb bring assurance to the hearts of all who mourn. Help us always to live in joyful anticipation of the day when you will call us from our graves. Reunite Andrew's family with Andrew and all believers one day and fill us all with the perfect bliss of your presence forever. Amen. We also include in our prayers 
Catherine Mayer's granddaughter, Lily, who was hospitalized with viral pneumonia and low oxygen. We pray. Lord Jesus, who blessed the little children and held them up as an example of faith, hold your hand a blessing over Lily, who's ill. Bring healing to your child. If it is your will that this illness linger, assure Lily and her parents of your loving presence, even in this time of hardship. <laughs> we entrust this family into your loving hands, even as we join together in praying the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He made his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Hosanna in the highest. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
strengthen and preserve you with the one true faith, a life everlasting, impart in peace. We have returned to you, Father, repenting in dust and ashes, washed in the cleansing waters of baptism, strengthened through the body and blood of your Son, given for us for the forgiveness of our sin. For all this, we give you thanks. And through your word and sacrament, increase our trust in you and strengthen our service to others. We pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, hymn 823.
Once again, good afternoon and welcome. Such a privilege to lead you in worship this afternoon. Next Wednesday, Pastor Gary Pufal from Emmanuel in Tempe is going to be our guest speaker. So uh, come back and hear what he has to say about the dinner and the final steps Jesus took to that dinner. Uh, right after the service, we're going to be having a, a meal. We'd like to ask the Lord's blessings on our meal. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. We'll see you all Sunday.